your students? So it's a mix. So some of them have had a taste of alternate dispute resolution, whereby okay. they study okay. mediation along with arbitration and negotiation. Right. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah that, that's fine. Just to get a sense of what people know. I mean, okay. I'll, I'll do a little bit at the beginning about mediation in, in general terms. Okay. Faster, you are live. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. You can start now. Yes. So a very warm welcome, everyone. Uh, we at the Center for Constitutional Law and Policy have been organizing a number of programs uh, over the last few weeks, whereby we call upon various uh, dignitaries, both from India as well as abroad, to deliver uh, sessions on certain very contemporary or very evergreen issues. So today is one such day. We have uh, Professor Brian Clark, uh, who is a professor of law and civil justice at the University of Newcastle. Uh, who will be enlightening all of us in his expert talk on mediation and access to justice. So this is one of kind of an evergreen topics. Uh, if you talk about various uh, states across the world, a lot of them are dealing with a lot of backlog in the judiciary, where, whereby they struggle to uh, try the cases on time and then uh, come up with a judgment on time. So. We talk about ADR and within alternative dis dispute resolution, mediation is talked about a lot. It is one of those means which can actually help in achieving our goal of smooth and efficient administration and access to justice. So uh, Professor Clark is a professor of law and civil justice uh, at the University of Newcastle in the UK. Uh, he is a mediation scholar and commercial lawyer and has been active in the field for over 20 years. Uh, his main research interests focus on the interaction between mediation and formal civil justice and the workings of courts and lawyers. He's a global advisor for Mediate Guru, a board member of the Arab Mediation Center, an advisor for Lex Erudites, and a former trustee of Scottish Mediation. So, sir, we are really privileged to have you with us today. Well, Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Faze, for that very kind and uh, generous um, introduction. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today and get the chance to be involved in this seminar series. I think it's a fantastic thing that you're doing, and I'm just I'm happy to be one of your contributors um, for that. Um, I hope that all of you who are logging on today, um, wherever you are um, in the world, I hope that you're safe and well right now, um, obviously it's been an incredibly um, difficult period for many of us in different jurisdictions um, because of COVID. Um, and I, I guess that one of the small benefits or the few benefits of the current situation has been the massive growth in online engagement through this kind of seminar, um, where you get an opportunity for people across borders and different jurisdictions to come together and share knowledge and ideas and I really hope that we continue to do this when the pandemic is over. I've done a number of these seminars and I think it's a, a great development and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. Um, and as I say, it's a very small compensation for the very difficult time that we've all had over the last um, 16 months. I think that many of you on the call today um, are students, law students, young lawyers, and it's especially gratifying for me to get the chance to talk to you because you are the leaders of tomorrow. You're the future of the legal profession in your own jurisdictions. Some of you will be future leaders within mediation, which is really my field. Um, so it's great for me to be a small part of your journey, your development and learning in these areas. So this is a real honor for me to be part of this um, today. So I'm gonna share my slides now, if I can. So let me take one second. Oh, uh, Faze, can you, Enable me to share my slides, please. It's disabled at the moment. Give me. So uh, you can, you may try now. I can, right. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, one second. It's coming up now, and take that off. You should I'll take the slide show on, and hopefully you can see that. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, is this relationship between mediation and um, access uh, to justice. Um, as Faze was saying, one of my principal research interests over the last 20 years or so um, has been mediation 
and I'll talk about that process in a second and explain what that what that's about. Uh, but particularly the way that mediation interacts with formal civil legal justice, um, access to justice, the workings of courts and lawyers and judges, and how those two different things come together, and what that means both for mediation, but also what it means for access to justice and the rights that we all have constitutionally to access our legal rights through the civil courts. And that's been a principal um, interest of mine for some time. And I thought that given that I wanted to give this some kind of constitutional flavor, I would talk about this topic uh, with you all um, today. So this is just a quick primer here, a quick sort of um, overview of, um, oh, I've gone too far there, of what I'm going to talk about um, today. So there are four different sets of issues I want to explore with you um, today. So I'll begin with a, a quick overview a discussion of the modern development of mediation, a quick primer, um, defining the process. I know that some of you will have experience in mediation, some of you might not have experience, and I'll, I'll keep this quite short. And then I want to talk about the way in which across the globe, uh, mediation has begun to be merged within the formal civil court system. And I want to talk about how this has occurred but also why, and the second question is very important because it gives us an insight into the motivations of those who have sought to bring mediation into the civil court system. Um, and it's quite an unusual issue in a way, because if you think about it, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about this later, uh, mediation represents an alternative way of resolving disputes, which traditionally sits out with or outside of the court system, but actually in reality, it's been brought within it in many jurisdictions. And that raises a number of interesting questions, I think. And then we move on to, I think, what's the central question that we're going to look at today um, in this um, seminar. Um, does mediation improve access to justice? Um, and actually, there's quite significant debate around this. And those who believe that it's something very important, that it helps expand access to justice, for all those in society, but others would argue that it perhaps acts as a barrier to the ability to access to justice. So we'll talk about some of the arguments there around that. And it's not an easy question to answer, it's a nuanced issue. And we'll discuss some of the issues which arise in that sense. And at the end, I just want to talk about um, the future of mediation um, and talk about some potential future developments um, within formal civil justice systems um, and also identify some challenges there and talk about some solutions which we might think about to remedy some of these difficulties that exist. And at that point, um, uh, we can then open up for questions. And I think there'll be about 10, maybe 15 minutes at the end um, to allow the students to um, raise questions if they, if they have any. Um, so just moving on now to the development of modern mediation. So we'll begin with the basics um, of mediation um, at the outset. So many of you will know this, but just to clarify here, uh, mediation is quite a simple process in reality. And effectively it's, it's, it's a negotiation. It, it's a set piece negotiation. It's generally an event, or it can be a series of events where the parties negotiate some kind of resolution to their dispute with the added feature of a third party neutral, sometimes more than one, that we call a mediator. Sometimes the language of conciliation is used and quite often that's a very similar process. And the role of the mediator is essentially to assist the parties in the resolution of their dispute. That's essentially what it's about. And unlike the case with litigation and arbitration, the mediator is not a decision maker. He or she does not impose an outcome upon the parties. In the classic model of facilitative mediation, the mediator doesn't give the parties advice. He doesn't tell them what to do. Um, he or she doesn't evaluate their legal case um, or tell them whether or not it would be reasonable to accept an offer from the other side, for example. Now, some models involve that kind of behavior, but the classic, if you like, Western facilitative model the mediator doesn't do those things. He or she is there merely to assist the parties to, to resolve the matter at hand and help to 
facilitate communications between the parties, help them understand each other better. And mediation is available in lots of different dispute areas, including, including employment, commercial, family, housing, international disputes, environmental disputes, a whole range of areas where mediation has now become very popular. And there are lots of well-known benefits or key characteristics of mediation, perceived advantages. So for example, it's argued that, and the evidence bears this out much of the time, that mediation can entail significantly lower costs and can be much quicker in terms of resolution than litigating or going through arbitration, for example. And that might be saving costs for the parties, but also crucially, and I'll talk about this later, saving money for the state. And that's a key issue in bringing mediation into civil justice. And um, one of the other potential advantages is confidentiality. And um, unlike the public glare of the courts, um, mediation is generally speaking a private and confidential process. So parties can avoid airing their dirty laundry in public, having their trade secrets put out in court, for example. So confidentiality can be very important. And related to that is this notion of it being without prejudice. And what that means essentially is that anything I say, anything disclosed in a mediation, in the event that the mediation is not successful and the parties have to go to court, then generally speaking, and it's a general rule, um, nothing disclosed can be disclosed in a subsequent litigation. It cannot be used against me in court afterwards. Again, mediation is a flexible process which can lead to creativity and outcome. And what this means is, is that potentially the parties can reach solutions which go way beyond the limited palette of remedies available to a court. So it could include, for example, apologies, explanations, assurances that something won't happen again, an agreement as to how the parties will communicate in the future, an agreement how the parties will work together on future projects, for example, usually beyond the gift of a court judgment. And another, I think, quite um, well-known advantage is what's known as self-determination. So key to mediation, unlike the case with arbitration and litigation, is that the parties themselves resolve the dispute. They decide to reach an agreement if they want to. They decide the terms of that agreement. And that may hold certain advantages for the parties, and I'll talk about some of those a bit later. And finally here, because of the collaborative, because of the con consensual nature of mediation, it's argued that it's, that it's likely to lead to the preservation of a relationship between the parties. It could be a business relationship, it could be a personal relationship, and even enhancing that relationship because of the very useful conversation the parties have had within mediation. And that's quite unlike the situation in litigation and arbitration, because those are adversarial processes, which involve a lot of tension, which can polarize the parties further. And quite often that leads to the, the, the destruction of the relationship between the parties. Now, we're talking about modern mediation here. And I'm gonna speak about the way that modern mediation has become part of the formal civil justice process in many jurisdictions. But of course, mediation is nothing new. It's an ancient process deployed in societies across the globe to resolve disputes where traditionally authority figures such as elders resolve disputes between community members. And mediation was practiced in pre-capitalist tribal societies in ancient Greek cultures, as well as in medieval England. And I also know it's been present in India for centuries. I was listening to a speech um, given by a very famous Indian mediator, um, Sandana Ramachandran. I'm sure that some of you will know her. And she was saying that India um, gave mediation to the world two and a half thousand years ago when the Buddha first chose mediation as the wise choice. So it's been around for a long time in many jurisdictions. But having said that, there was a rebirth, if you like, of mediation in the modern context. And we typically trace that back 
to the ADR movement, this alternative dispute resolution movement, which is seen by many to have its birthplace in Minnesota, the USA, 1976, in this Pound Conference that some of you uh, may have heard of. Now, the Pound Conference was a coming together of eminent legal jurists, legal scholars, judges, government officials, and um, law societies. And it was designed to tackle what was perceived to be a crisis in civil justice in the United States at that time. So the courts were horribly overburdened. They were busting at the seams. If you wanted to take a case to court, it would take many months, if not years, it would cost a lot of money. They were crippled by rising caseloads and something had to be done about that. And one of the outcomes of this conference was the idea that we could divert cases away from litigation to more appropriate mm -hmm. other processes, um, such as um, mediation. And mediation became incredibly popular in the aftermath of the Pound Conference, particularly through um, court-sponsored mediation in the USA. So where the courts would refer parties to mediation, I'll talk much more about that later. And this has led to developments across the globe, including India, I know, um, Australia, Singapore, the United States, sorry, the United Kingdom, Canada, across continental Europe. It's become incredibly common. Um, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail um, now. So let's move that along here. What's very interesting when you look at the development of mediation in most um, jurisdictions is that mediation only tends to develop well um, when it becomes, oh, I've moved forward again, sorry about that. Um, when it becomes linked in some way to the formal civil justice system. So even though mediation classically is this alternative to legal disputing, it sits outside the courts, it only seems quite paradoxically, it only seems to develop well when it's brought inside the civil court system. And I'll talk about why that's the case in a second, but how does this arise? What kind of form does it take? So for example, you might have in-court mediation programs where if you go to court, there may be an in-court scheme where parties are either offered the chance to mediate or in some cases it's compulsory. So if you go to court, you're bound first to resolve the matter or attempt to resolve the matter by mediation. And I'll speak more about mandatory mediation um, soon. You may also have judicial referral to mediation where judges refer parties to external mediators. In some of those in-court schemes, you have judges, sitting judges, mediating cases. That's quite an interesting idea because judges are there to objectively hear the evidence, to listen to facts, to make rulings based upon the law. But here they are mediating cases, negotiating cases with parties. Um, you also have certain financial imperatives. So, here in the UK, for example, or certainly in England, we have a, what's called a cost sanctions regime, whereby mediation is currently not compulsory, but um, if you refuse an invitation to mediate, either made by a judge or by your opponent, um, then it's possible that um, the court may view that your refusal was unreasonable and that you should have mediated. And even if you win the case, you may be penalized for your refusal to mediate in terms of court costs, which can be very significant. Um, equally, you have, for example, um, linking with legal aid provision. So again, here in England, we have very, very limited legal aid now. So for those who cannot afford their own lawyers, um, it's almost impossible to get legal aid in civil cases in England, contract cases, employment cases, um, family cases, for example. Legal aid is simply no longer available, but legal aid is available in some circumstances for mediation. So it's promoted that way. The other way in which you see it coming into the legal system is through, for example, professional obligations placed upon lawyers by their own professional rules to engage in mediation. So for example, they may be bound prior to bringing a case to court to discuss the possibility of mediating a case 
with their clients or to discuss that with opposing counsel and to evidence that to the court when they seek to raise the action. And equally, again, something which is happening in various jurisdictions. I'm aware that in India quite recently, the professional requirements were changed, um, whereby new Indian lawyers require to be trained to some degree um, in ADR and mediation, alternative dispute resolution and mediation. Um, so again, that's bringing it into the traditional legal sphere. Now, so that's how it's been happening. But why has it been happening? And, and I think the why is a more interesting question for our own purposes. And much of the growth of mediation, I think, within the civil justice system has been for efficiency reasons. And what that means is that rather than any deep-seated belief in the qualitative benefits of mediation itself, largely promotion has occurred because of the efficiencies it can provide for the civil justice system. So in the desire to save public costs in administering civil courts, a desire to ration judicial time in the administration of civil justice and divert cases away from court, to free up the courts to deal with, if you like, the more important cases. So parties who really need to access courts can do so in a much more accessible way. It's a more streamlined system. So we divert the other cases away to other processes such as mediation. Now, quite unfairly, these cases are sometimes termed garbage cases. That was a term used in some of the early literature in the United States when this started to happen. So these are cases which are typically of low value, um, which may not involve particularly interesting legal issues, which tend not to be of incredible societal implication or value. And these cases are seen to be not worth that much. They're siphoned away into other forms such as mediation. Now that's very controversial. Now I'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, now, of course, civil justice in any democratic society, it's incredibly important, but it does require to be rationed. And um, living in these straightened economic times, many parts of the Western world, for example, went through significant recession, um, budgets require to be cut. And generally speaking, the civil justice budget is one of the first to be cut in many jurisdictions. And many people have seen civil justice as being in fact under attack, under assault. And the cuts have meant it's no longer seen as a public good for society's benefit, which should be funded by the state and available to all in society, but rather seen more as a private service for those who have disputes if they can pay for it. Um, so that's the, the ongoing debate here. But what we've definitely seen um, in a desire to create more efficiencies is more diversion away to, to mediation. So let's look at the principal question now about mediation and to what extent it does improve um, access to justice. And I want to present you with a balanced set of views about this. So I'm going to begin with the case against. And I'm then going to talk about rebutting some of these ideas and talk about the case for because my own personal view is that it is a balanced issue. And I am a mediation enthusiast, I'm generally in favor. Um, but I want to set out some of the arguments for you. I don't necessarily believe these arguments, but I'm setting them out because they're prevalent in the literature and they're views that we need to consider and tackle. So the first point to you is that unlike the court process, mediation is not a process fundamentally concerned with the, the assertion of legal rights. And many jurisdictions, in fact, have seen a growth in minority rights in recent years. So for example, in the UK and the US, over recent decades, there's been a growth in um, rights for um, the, the poorer in society in respect of things such as employment, housing, immigration, um, discrimination, so women's rights, um, the rights for different um, um, racial groups, for example, which have been enshrined in law. Um, 
But the argument is that a process such as mediation is not fundamentally concerned with protecting those rights. It's a negotiation. It's about trying to settle the case. It doesn't necessarily uphold the rights of those individuals. And what we've seen actually, because of this diversion to mediation and those kind of processes, these minority rights have in fact become harder to access and enforce because court is no longer available. And rights are meaningless, it can be argued, if in reality they cannot be enforced. And, and that's a problem. One of the critiques of mediation over the years is that it doesn't deal with power imbalance as well, where there's a significant power imbalance between parties and that can operate in different ways. So one party is more eloquent, more confident, has more access to greater resources and legal advice, has more experience in the process than the other. So a small individual who's never been involved in the court system before against a big business. In a family case, a husband against a wife, for example, um, there's a significant feminist critique of mediation also in the literature. And the idea is that mediation doesn't tackle those power imbalances as well. And in fact, that the privacy of mediation allows perpetrators of wrongdoing to hide their wrongdoing, to hide their malpractice. Socially undesirable practices go unnoticed. They are swept under the carpet. They're not discussed in open court. They're privately negotiated away. And part of the reason for this is because if you think about the mediation process, at least in the classic sense, mediators are neutral. They act in a facilitative way. They do not judge the situation. Um, the process is what's called norm generating. And what that means is that typically speaking, any settlements produced are based on norms determined by the parties themselves. They decide on what basis they're going to resolve it. The mediator doesn't interject classically and say, wait a minute, I think a fairer outcome is this, given the situation here. And of course, so any power imbalances may be replicated in that agreement. A very famous critique of bringing mediation too much into mainstream civil justice is Dame Professor Hazel Genn. And she's been very critical of the fact that mediation may not be concerned with objective fairness because mediators just want to settle cases. This is a very famous, very cleverly put phrase of Hazel Gens that gave a lot of food for thought to the mediation community. And she said that mediation is not about just settlement. It is just about settlement. Very clever, um, but it had a real resonance, I think, within the field. Mediators are not concerned with objective fairness. And I think the last point is also quite important. If you think back, you know, why has mediation been brought in to the civil justice system to produce efficiencies, to save time and money. So funding models for mediation services are based upon being efficient. So if I want to set up a mediation scheme and go to the local court and say, look, just give me your cases, I'll resolve them, I'll take them away from your overworked judges. I want to say, well, I'll be able to resolve 10 in a day. I'll resolve all of them, or maybe nine out of 10. Um, I don't need much time or resource um, I can guarantee that. And that leads to settlement heavy based practices where mediators want to settle as many cases as possible. The quality becomes poor. They pressurize parties into settling. Um, and that's detrimental for the parties concerned. And what you also often find at the lower end of the scale is that lawyers often act. So it's parties without who have a lack of understanding of their legal case, who need advice but are not getting it, who don't know what they might be giving up by agreeing to something in mediation with a more powerful adversary. Um, and those issues, I think, are problematic, I think, and we need to think about how to address them. So let's go on and look at um, the case for, so rebutting some of these ideas. And I think the first fundamental point is to think about justice. And we need to think as to how that term is defined and what it means to different people. 
And classically speaking, we think of formal justice being the justice found in court, where we present a case and the verifiable facts become evidence and the appropriate laws apply to those facts and we get a just result. Um, but justice is not only found in legal norms. Justice is a pluralistic notion. It holds different meanings to different people. And parties involved in mediation, for example, may find their own sense of justice, what they believe to be fair, in mediated outcomes. And that might be quite different to what they might be entitled to in a court or, what, or the remedy that a court might provide. And we know from research that many parties who come to court and they're often seeking compensation, let's say, they often have a number of other extra legal needs, such as the need for an explanation or the need to be heard or a need for an apology. Um, and very often we know through the court process, those extra legal needs are never met. And even if they win, we know from research, sometimes parties feel an enduring sense of dissatisfaction because those needs are not met. And I think that if mediation is conducted well, then those needs can be met in mediation. Other thing to mention here is that we need to be careful and think about what we're comparing mediation to. And what we know from many jurisdictions is that many non-mediated cases will settle anyway. So to give you the example of civil litigation in England, so general civil litigation, um, we know from research that over 95% of all cases filed in the English civil courts do not proceed to trial. There's never a judgment. There's never a definitive ruling on the legal aspects. Those cases either fall away or they settle and they often settle quite late. And so if you bring in diversion to mediation for that kind of case at an earlier stage, all you're really doing most of the time is replacing one form of settlement with another. Late negotiated settlement, you replace that with an earlier mediated settlement, which may be better actually, probably a better process, um, and it may save the party's time and money. The other point to make, true I think, in commercial mediations, where lawyers would tend to be involved representing parties in those cases, um, legal norms are very, very relevant in helping inform a mediated settlement. And, I do quite a lot of work coaching young lawyers in mediation advocacy, how to represent their clients in mediation. And I say to them, even though this is an interest-based process where we're trying to meet both sides' mutual interests um, and come to a mutually agreeable solution, um, it's good to begin quite strong and set out your legal position and show confidence in that because it gives you a place to negotiate from. and being honest about that, that can often inform the outcome. Um, so that in itself is um, important there. Um, in terms of these power imbalances that I talked about before and how mediation doesn't often deal with it or arguably doesn't deal with it well, um, nonetheless, there's quite a lot that mediators can do, I think, to seek to alleviate power and you have to think about if mediation doesn't take place, part of parties, their fate may be worse ultimately if there's no mediation at all. Um, but mediators can seek to equalize the party's relationship by setting ground rules at the beginning, saying this is a safe space, there'll be no abusive language. We're not going to allow one party to bully the other. I'm gonna treat you equally with respect, um, exactly the same way, um, I'm going to give you the, the same amount of my attention um, also. And certainly they can also advise parties sometimes to take legal advice if they can. Um, and uh, the issue is, you know, how is mediation being conducted? The other part about power imbalances is that it would be naive for us to believe that power imbalances 
are not also present and relevant in court processes. You know that if you take a case to court, if you have more resources, you can afford to go through different processes, you can employ better lawyers, and you have an advantage in the court process also. Those power imbalances are present in that context as well. The next issue is also quite important, and it's about the enforceability of outcomes rendered in, medi in mediation, what we sometimes call the durability of mediated outcomes. And there's quite significant evidence suggesting that mediated outcomes are adhered to by the parties to a greater extent than comparable judgments imposed upon the parties in, for example, litigation and arbitration. In mediation, of course, the parties have voluntarily reached an agreement. It's their own agreement. They have a sense of ownership over it. And we know because of that, they are more likely to adhere to it in practice. They're less likely to adhere to a judgment imposed upon them that they disagree with, that they want to avoid at all costs. And we know in litigation, commercial arbitration, very commonly parties will seek to avoid, they will appeal a decision, seek to avoid enforcement, for example. Um, I, in my previous role, um, did a lot of work with young law students and in a law clinic which was attached to my university. And the law clinic gave advice and assistance and also representation in tribunals and lower courts um, to people in society who couldn't afford to pay for lawyers. And many students misunderstood that if they won a case for their client, many of them felt that that was the end of the matter and that in the day, the judge would hold the other guy up by the ankles like that, the money would fall from their pockets and their client would take the money and say, thank you very much. But of course, you know, it's not like that. And if you win a case, it can be very, very difficult in practice to enforce that judgment. People will simply not comply. We know that mediation, the evidence suggests, is much more likely to lead to parties complying with agreements reached. And the final point to talk about to you um, is this issue of what's called procedural justice that I'm sure that some of you have heard about before. We tend to think about justice being found in the outcomes of a court proceeding or a mediation, for example. But procedural justice is incredibly important. And this pertains to the procedure by which a decision or an outcome has been reached, the procedure itself. And our view of the procedure is incredibly important in informing our view of an outcome. And we know from evidence that if we view that the procedure by which an outcome has been rendered was fair and just, we are much more likely to view that outcome as being fair and just. Um, regardless of the outcome, in fact, the procedure has a significant bearing on the way we view the outcome. So what does procedural justice mean? Well, there are various factors that need to be present before we typically believe a process was fair. Um, were we treated with dignity and respect in the process? Uh, did we have a chance to participate in the process? Were we heard by somebody in authority? And we know from research that where mediation is conducted well, that um, parties believe that procedurally it was just and fair. And quite often that's not the case in the court. If you think about court processes, you may feel you're not treated as a litigant with dignity and respect. You may feel you're not really able to participate in the process on your own terms. You can't simply tell your story. You're very limited in what you can say and how you can engage. And equally, you may feel you've not been heard. Uh, now, we know also from research that poor mediation also suffers from those deficits. And um, so it's not necessarily a problem just something that occurs um, in the court um, process. So I want to just go on to look at um, mandatory mediation specifically now. Um, and we've touched upon this idea um, already. And this is a particularly controversial idea. And the idea is that parties who come before court before they're able to access the court, for example, they are bound 
to attempt mediation first. Now, mandatory mediation has been controversial for many years, and not least within the mediation community itself, many of whom are not happy with the idea. It's very much at odds with the fundamental origins, the consensual nature of mediation, but it's become common in many jurisdictions now. So I know, for example, in India, um, that there were recent amendments made to the Commercial Act, Commercial Courts Act of 2015, and a new section um, 12A now makes it mandatory for parties to exhaust the remedy of mediation prior to an institution of a suit under the Act. And we've seen mandatory mediation arise across Europe in places like Italy and Greece and in parts of the United States, in Australia, and it's becoming more common. Absolutely. Mandatory mediation has a number of different meanings. It can operate in different ways. So it can be that kind of blanket approach that I've just talked about, where if you want to access a certain court, you must first, in all cases, attempt mediation. Or it might be what's known more as a discretionary approach, where a judge or a court official can decide that your case is suitable for mediation when it comes to court and tell you that you have to mediate. Or it might be that you are bound to attend a mediation information session on a mandatory basis. Again, in England, in the area of family divorce disputes, for example, um, parties before they access the court are bound to attend a mediation information meeting. Not mediation as such, but they must attend an information session about it. Now, why has this occurred? Why has mandatory mediation become um, very common? And you go to the next box in the top right. It's become incredibly attractive for policymakers, um, given the efficiencies I've already talked about that mediation can produce in the administration of civil justice. And it's also become popular because, and this is somewhat of an unusual, well, I, I guess it may be unexpected to some degree, um, there is often very low voluntary uptake of mediation, and you find quite significant user and lawyer resistance to mediation. Um, so why would there be a low voluntary uptake in mediation? Um, if I can put it this way, if you stopped somebody in the street and you explained to them what mediation was about and talked about potential benefits and how the process might unfold. And then you said to them, if you had a dispute, do you think you would use mediation? They might well say yes, because they'll say, well, it's a common sense idea. It seems to work. It may improve my relationship with the other side. But when you speak to people in the midst of an actual dispute, you may get a very different response indeed. And if you think about that, when you're in the middle of a dispute, things get very hostile very quickly. The parties get very polarized. It gets very acrimonious. You begin to enlist champions, often lawyers, to fight your cause. You want to win. You want the other party to suffer. You want your day in court. You want a judge to publicly say, you're right, they're wrong. You want them to suffer, hopefully in public, because that's the way that we behave in dispute. And mediation with its promise of compromise, reconciliation, is not often an attractive option at that time. That's just the reality. I don't want to compromise with that person. I don't want to sit in the same room and share the air that they breathe. Um, that's not what I want at all. I want to win, I want to fight. And this is evidenced in many contexts, in many jurisdictions. So you do get significant user resistance which is why governments make it mandatory. They think it will work anyway, or work often enough to save money. And they're probably right about that. Um, and you also have lawyer resistance. I won't say too much about that in the context of this um, discussion today, because I'm getting quite far through the time. But we know for many different reasons that lawyers may resist mediation because they're ignorant about it, um, because there may be financial reasons why lawyers may prefer to litigate, for example, but also simply there are cultural reasons. 
mediation simply doesn't fit the normal modus operandi, the normal way of working for lawyers in handling disputes. Um, one of the big questions which has occurred, um, certainly in the UK, is to what extent mandatory mediation is compatible with fundamental democratic constitutional rights. And this is an argument played out in different jurisdictions. Um, in the UK, because we are a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, and um, the state must act in accordance with the fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined within that international instrument. And one of the key articles is Article 6, this right that we all have to a fair trial, to legal proceedings in civil and criminal matters. And for many years, it was believed in England on the basis of a very famous case called Halsey that some of you may have heard of. It was believed that to compel parties to mediate was contrary to Article 6. Now, there's been great debate about this in recent years, and judges in various cases tilting towards supporting mandatory mediation. But no less than two days ago, actually, a report from the Civil Justice Council has now determined that mandatory mediation does not infringe Article 6. And I think in England we're going to see much more of it, but it's expanding across different jurisdictions. One particular issue which arises is that there is a fear that by compelling people to mediate, you are in fact compelling them in practice to settle. They will feel that they have no choice but to actually settle the case. They don't want to go back before the judge and say, look, we've tried, but we couldn't settle. They'll be afraid of that. They may be put under pressure by mediators who want to settle cases. I think the evidence for that idea is not that strong at the moment. Settlement rates in mandatory mediation environments tend, in fact, to be lower than in voluntary mediation environments. Um, but there is always a danger that that may arise. And some of the issues I addressed before, um, issues around power imbalances, um, for example, they become incredibly important if we're compelling people to mediate. How will we deal with that? Um, what about the quality of service? Who are the mediators? How are they trained? How are they regulated? If something goes wrong, do I have some form of redress? In many jurisdictions, those issues are very undeveloped. Mediation is not heavily regulated. I think that's still the case in India too, that there's limited regulation of the process. How will that work? And again, access to legal advice in the process becomes very important. So I am running out of time because I want to leave a bit of time left. So I'll just spend a few minutes um, going through the future of mediation in formal civil justice. I think we're going to see much more growth in many jurisdictions with mediation growing through the civil justice system, not least through online dispute resolution. I think Faze in his opening comment talked about the backlog of cases that many civil jurisdictions um, have suffered uh, because of COVID with the cessation of court business. And we've migrated much business online. And I think that will continue because of the efficiencies involved. And a huge amount of online mediation. And it seems to work much better than people thought it would. Um, so I think we're going to see more online dispute resolution, and that lends itself to processes such as mediation. Don't get me wrong, I see quite significant societal benefits accruing from this. I am a believer in mediation. If it's conducted well in the proper circumstances, it can really reap significant benefits for the parties, but also for society. And when you look at research connected to court-based programs, very often you find high levels of user satisfaction. But having said that, shifting mediation, this alternative process, into mainstream civil justice, you can argue it calls for a fresh evaluation of its normative character. I'm just going to kind of leave these here. I'm not going to explain them in any detail, but just ask questions. Self-determination is seen to be a fundamental um, component of good mediation. But is it appropriate when you think about the role of the court to mete out formal justice, when the court is compelling parties to mediate and those parties don't have lawyers? Are they able or should they be allowed to self-determine an outcome in those circumstances when they may be prejudiced against more powerful opponents 
and they've got no legal advice in the process. Getting the informed consent of participants in mediation is crucial. Some of you will know that informed consent has its origins in medical law, where we talk about if a medical professional is going to conduct some procedure on me, I need to understand what that is. I need to know the benefits potentially, but also some of the potential risks. And similarly, we need to be sure that people involved in mediation know what the process is about. They understand the benefits, but they also understand what they might be giving up in terms of outcomes rendered. If I'm going to agree to an outcome in mediation, which might actually sacrifice some of my potential legal rights, but I'm happy to do so, but I need to know what those rights are before I can make an informed choice to sacrifice them. It might be the right thing to do, but I need to be aware of them. And that becomes important. So we need to ensure access to relevant legal information, at least for litigants without lawyers. Who will provide that for them? How can they access that? We also need to recognize the danger, as I've talked about, of efficiency-driven processes. If it's all about saving the state time and money, what is mediation going to look like? It might be quite shoddy some of the time. Um, and linked to that, and I've talked about this, quality assurance, proper regulation and training, redress mechanisms um, are also essential. So I think that's about um, 10 to now. Um, so thank you very much for attending today and listening. Um, I've really enjoyed sharing some ideas for you. That's my contact details. If anyone needs the slides, I'm quite happy to send them on to you um, in due course. Um, I'll stop sharing now. And uh, yep, I'll pass it back to Faze and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody does have at this stage. Faze, I think I've lost you here. You have. Oh. I seem to have frozen here. Ah, I think phase has disappeared actually. Um, so I'm quite happy to answer any questions anyone has in the next five minutes, if there are any. Yes, so I have. Uh, so okay. I like what you believe. Uh, like, uh, I feel the new way of uh, like procedures will be uh, the new mode, like the o oh, the outside court settlements, which are now online also. So uh, we can see them in criminal cases. Like, uh, is the is my question? Like, where, is the future of uh, like lawyers being the procedures, whatever happens, is online on OTDs, or uh, will it be like the judgments which are being given? Will that be uh, can we consider them in criminal cases also, like outside court settlements in criminal cases? Okay, yeah, well, a couple of issues there. About um, online dispute resolution, first of all, I think we are going to see more migration of activity online. We're seeing it in all sectors. I mean, in the academic sector as well, we're doing more teaching online, we're doing conferences and seminars and meetings online to a greater degree. I think you're going to see court business, and um, particularly in, in more, I guess, minor actions and lower value cases. A lot of that's going to migrate in many jurisdictions to online interface. That raises a lot of questions about the accessibility of online provision for all in society, issues about security, engagement, being able to engage properly on the online environment. But I think, yeah, we're going to see more of it. And, and obviously it suits some people and doesn't suit um, others. About the issue about criminal um, justice and mediation, I guess the way that mediation operates in that sphere is slightly different because um, in a mediation, of course, in a civil case, it, it's two parties. Um, in a civil action, but in criminal law, of course, 
there is somebody who has committed an offence against the state to some degree. So there may be an admission of responsibility as part of that process. I think that the term that we use here is, is restorative justice, um, where um, a, a victim meets with the perpetrators to discuss the crime that's occurred, and there may be an apology issued in some kind of explanation. Um, I guess we're probably going to see more of that also um, developing in different jurisdictions. We have had that in the UK for 30 or 40 years, actually, in different contexts. But I think that, yes, you, you're likely to see, I think, further development of these kind of processes in criminal justice as well. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? Anyone? Any other questions from the students? Am I audible? Say, say somewhere. Go ahead. Try to be a little louder. Uh, now, am I audible, sir? Sir, yeah, could you please brief up with the use or the purpose of distributed mediation services? Sorry, can you just repeat that to me, please? <laughs> could you elaborate or could you briefly explain us on the use of distributed mediation devices? Like, what exactly yeah. does it do? Sorry, I, I, I missed. So you're talking about distributed mediation devices. I'm not quite sure I know what you mean there. Yeah, yeah. She, if you could elaborate on that, on distributive mediation devices, like what exactly do you mean by that? So uh, according to my knowledge, it is some kind of algorithm which is based, like it is a protocol. It has been introduced that the distributed node this strategy or uh, some uh, increase in energy saving? Could you like get that? Right, okay, is this something specific to India? Is it uh, something in, in India, do you think? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have knowledge of that particular development. Is, that, is it an Indian development um, particularly? I don't think it's in India. I was just randomly going through this and I got some reading material. So I just went through it and I couldn't ah, understand. Right. So I okay. I tell you what you can do. Could you possibly, I've given you my email address or I'm sure that FaZe will be able to give it um, for you. If you just give me an email with that question, I'll, I'll look into it for you and I'll, I'll try to give you a good answer. Okay? Thank you. No problem. Okay. Any other questions, anyone? So, uh, am I audible, uh, Professor Brian? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening. So, uh, I have yeah, a question. Uh, sure. Hello, sir. It was a brilliant hello. session. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. But, uh, my question to you is, what is the scope of co-mediation in India, especially in family disputes? Yeah, I mean, uh, co-mediation is, is something that's quite common in, in the UK, actually. And it does arise sometimes in family matters in the UK. It, it certainly is very common in areas such as neighborhood disputes and equally in areas such as commercial disputes as well. It's quite common to have a senior mediator with a junior to assist them. Um, and certainly when we do a lot of teaching in mediation in the universities, we normally teach a co-mediation model to give students the chance to gain practice, but also to work with somebody else. And I, I think it's very useful. Um, I guess in some spheres of practice and family, for example, it might be common to have a family lawyer as one of the mediators. And then if somebody with a social work background or a counselling background as the other mediator, so that they can complement each other with their different skill sets. Um, I think it is a good model because people have different strengths and different weaknesses and they've got a different, people have different approaches. And if you can find someone that you can work with that can complement you and can fill in your gaps is better at some aspects of the process, it can work you know, very well. And it means that sometimes if, you know, I don't know how much mediation you've been involved in, but if you're, say for example, going into private session, and a private session means speaking to one party alone and leaving the other in a room by themselves. Um, if you've got a co-mediation model, you can always leave the other mediator with the other party while the one mediator goes and conducts the session. And then you go into the other room and, and leave the other mediator with them to keep them company essentially. So they don't feel isolated. So. Um, I think that co-mediation is something that is, has certain advantages. 
and it's fairly widely practiced in different contexts. And I think that family matters would be an area where, and certainly I can see many advantages with that. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions, anyone? All right. Any questions? So, sir, actually, whenever uh, we talk about ADR, there is this one question which always arises in my mind, which is basically based on, on an article uh, that the very fundamentals of mediation are somewhere down the line related to compromise, right? So, aren't we or isn't at least one of the parties to the mediation giving preference to peace rather than justice while carrying out mediation or for that matter any other form of ADR like you want to get things uh, sorted out you, you want to get it completed even though you know that rightfully probably you are the one who will who, like who is on the right side of the law but to get things sorted out quickly to save time you you are resorting to mediation yeah. so kind of you are giving preference to peace over justice what 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 would be your take on that yeah i i think that's uh you know it's a fair comment to make because as i said before mediation is not about enforcing your rights necessarily it's, it is about compromise ultimately but i think you need to think about what's more important for you in your current situation i always say to say to my law students if you're advising your clients about a case, you need to advise them on a lot more than just the legal aspects of that case to give them proper advice. Now, it may well be that my lawyer thinks that I've got a really strong case, that if I go to court, I will win. But you need to think about what that will look like. So what, is that pro what does that process entail? How long will it take to go to court? How much will it cost? How difficult will that be? And also, what are the other circumstances around that? Now, if I go to court, I will be subject to publicity that maybe I don't want. It's gonna be a public forum, it may be bad publicity. Um, equally, um, if I go to court with my opponent, our relationship's going to suffer. I'm gonna lose that business partnership, for example. So what's more important than sometimes the right thing to do? And actually much of the time, even if you feel that you have a legal right to something, it's sometimes the right thing to do not to pursue it and to compromise that away because your interests tell you otherwise. Your business interest, for example, is to compromise because you cannot afford to lose that client. You might take them to court and win, but then they'll be away and you will lose that future business. So it's a very interesting question, but the, but the reality is anyway that most parties with legal disputes that access court, in many cases, they settle anyway for those reasons. Um, and that's the case. I think also that mediation gives an opportunity to be more creative and think about wider solutions as well, to, to lead to improving relationships, uh, producing outcomes that actually benefit both parties. But you are fundamentally right. It's a choice to be made about um, whether or not to pursue rights. And, and law students, and, and, and as I'm a lawyer, and as lawyers, we tend, because we are trained as lawyers, we, we tend to focus on winning the fight, winning the case. We want to do that. We are given praise if we present winning arguments at law school if we're great mooters and advocates. But the reality is that that might not be the right thing for the client. And the right thing to do is to compromise um, because that will give a better outcome. Now, that's my take on it. But, uh, you know, you make a good point. Yeah, but like I remember uh, in our LLM program uh, two years back, we had this particular course on law and justice in a globalizing world, whereby once in the class it was not related to mediation actually but there was this de debate about doing the good thing and doing the right thing so th there's there's a difference between the two it's not necessary yeah. that the good thing will be right or the right thing will be good so perhaps this is something which we can apply here as well yeah uh, just, yeah, just a parting question sir uh, one of our senior faculties we already covered it in one of your slides one of our senior faculties has a question that whether mandatory mediation as per your opinion is contrary to fundamental rights uh, that is i mean it's an interesting question and i have to say that my own views over the years have shifted on this question um i have been thinking about it quite a lot i guess that the view that i've come to is that insofar as the process that we're compelled to undertake is properly um 
organized and is accessible and, the, and it's conducted in a fair fashion. And it genuinely does not obstruct ultimately the right to access court if you want to, then I feel that it's, it's not contrary to fundamental rights. Now that's, that's, both a, a, that's both a legal response in terms of my view of the legalities, but it's also a moral response for me as well. I was for many years probably against mandatory mediation, but I've, I've come into favor of it just on the basis that it's only an attempt to settle. And insofar as it caveated in this way, that it must be provided in a good way then um, I, I, I no longer, well, I wouldn't object to it in that way. But quite a lot of mediators don't like it. They wouldn't sign up for it. They still object to it. Um, but, you know, inevitably in England now, we're going to see more of it. And I think it, it will become more popular in different jurisdictions. Absolutely. Fascinating, sir. So thank you so much. We have, we have run into sort of extra time. But uh, thank you so much for taking out the time for us here at the Center for Constitutional Law and Policy and having discussed it, you know, your session was so fascinating, sir, that uh, any law student or for that matter, a non-law person as well would be able to get the crux of our discussion. So it was uh, really fascinating. Uh, good to know your views on that. We are extremely proud and privileged to host you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking out the time for us at the uh, Power Institute of Law. No, thank you very much. And, and again, thank you for inviting me and, and for the, you know, thank you for the excellent questions that were asked at the end as well. It's great to discuss these things with you. Um, so good luck, everybody. And um, I hope to see some of you again soon. Thank you so much. Sir. Bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.